Well, Mary, I always say there's nothing like a nice, quiet evening at home. Just sit back and relax and enjoy the open fireplace. What was that? Huh? Chet, did you hear that noise? Yeah, it came from the cellar. Oh. Hey, who's down there? Oh, nobody, I hope. There it is again. Chet, go see what it is. Maybe it's burglars. It's oh, anything to ruin my peace. <laughs> it sounds like somebody with a pop gun. Must be harmless. Unless he's a lunatic, of course. Chet. Oh, Chet, come back. Don't go down there. I'll phone the police. I'll... Oh, brother, what a mess. It's the tomatoes you canned last week. They're exploding all over the cellar. Oh, no, <laughs> Chet. Not my beautiful tomatoes. Stop uh, that laughing. This is right. Would you care to tell me the secret of your success? Oh, stop. Uh, just what is your formula for all the atomic power you have uh, stored in the cellar? Hmm? <laughs> if that gentleman doesn't watch his step, he'll have a different kind of explosion to deal with very shortly. But did you notice he mentioned atomic power? That phrase is a recent addition to our vocabularies, and one which doesn't have too much significance for many of us yet. That's why we're devoting this excursion in science to atomic power, so we'll know whereof we speak. And here's our science reporter, Emerson Markham, complete with explanations. Thank you, Bob Stone, and how do you do, everyone? Before we start our discussion, it might be well to establish our authority, Bob. We're indebted for our facts to one of the pioneers in the field, Dr. Kenneth H. Kingdon of the General Electric Research Laboratory. Dr. Kingdon was one of the first people to isolate U-235 back in 1935. Our thanks, then, to Dr. Kingdon, Emerson. The atomic bombs ought to open the door to a new world, didn't it? Indeed it did, Bob. It marked the first culmination of the greatest organized scientific effort ever made, too. During the next few minutes, we'll review, very briefly, the physical processes concerned and discuss the possible future application to power production and other problems. Probably the best place to start would be with the motion of an atom consisting of a relatively heavy, positively charged central nucleus, around which circulate negatively charged electrons carrying a total charge equal and opposite to that on the nucleus. The simplest atom, hydrogen, has a nucleus carrying one positive charge and called the proton. The next simplest atom, heavy hydrogen or deuterium, has a nucleus containing one proton and one neutron, the neutron being a particle of about the same mass as the proton, but without electrical charge. The neutron and the proton are the elementary building blocks of which all atomic nuclei are made. But yes, but where does U-235 come in? That's the element I associate with all this atomic business. Well, as we progress to the heavier and more complicated nuclei by adding neutrons and protons in approximately equal numbers, we come at last to the heaviest element, uranium, one species of which has a nucleus containing 92 protons and 143 neutrons and known as uranium-235, since the sum of these two numbers is 235 and represents its total mass. I follow you, I think. Where does all the energy come in? Before we get to that, Bob, I'd like to point out that at this point it is necessary to modify our simple building block picture of the nucleus a little. For when we weigh this uranium nucleus, we find that its mass is appreciably less than the aggregate masses of 92 protons and 143 neutrons. And a similar statement is true for the nuclei of practically all elements. That's a little confusing. How can that be? Well, the root of this discrepancy lies in one of the most fundamental principles of physics, which was deduced theoretically by Einstein some 35 years ago, and was regarded by him as the most remarkable result of the general theory of relativity. This principle states that mass and energy are two aspects of the same entity and are mutually convertible so that a neutron, for example, may be regarded as a small region of space in which a relatively enormous amount of energy has been concentrated and, so to speak, converted into mass. Conversely, whenever we produce energy, the production is always accompanied by a perfectly definite loss of mass from the energy-producing body. Maybe I'd understand better if you told us how this can be applied to the nucleus we were talking about. Very well. Applying this principle to the nucleus, we note that since the nucleus is a stable body, we would have to supply energy to tear it apart. And therefore, conversely, when the nucleus was formed, the proton and neutron components must have released energy during the formation process. The aggregate mass of the group of neutrons and protons is therefore less when they are assembled in the nucleus than it was when they were free and far apart. This so-called mass defect, Dr. Kingdon pointed out, varies from element to element 
and is relatively greatest for elements of mass numbers near 115, that is, for elements near the center of the periodic table. So how does uranium-235 look when viewed in this light, Emerson? It is clear, then, that if the uranium-235 nucleus could be split into approximately equal parts, these two daughter nuclei would together weigh less than the parent nucleus, and that, therefore, a considerable amount of energy would be released in this split or fission. This sort of thing constitutes the basis for the atomic bomb. What I'd like to know now is, how do you cause this fission? The most efficient way to cause fission of the uranium-235 nucleus is to add an extra neutron to it. However, neutrons do not occur free in nature, but must be liberated from other nuclei. The key to the problem lies in the fact that when a nucleus of uranium-235 picks up an extra neutron and undergoes fission, it liberates approximately two more neutrons during the fission process. And if things can be arranged so that one of these extra neutrons will cause fission in another uranium atom, the process will proceed indefinitely as a chain reaction and will act as a generator of energy. And can that actually be done? Must be rather complicated, to say the least. Well, the realization of this chain reaction does require a very special set of circumstances. I've attempted to describe what Dr. Kingdon explained to me about what has been done in the chain reaction units, or piles, which have been developed recently. Ordinary uranium metal consists of a mixture of three kinds of atoms of atomic weights 234, 235, and 238, more than 99% of the atoms being 238, and only 7 tenths of 1% being 235. Then why the popularity of 235 if it's such a small amount? Because the 235 atoms show the fission effect by far the most markedly, and are most susceptible to fission by relatively slow-moving neutrons, that is, by neutrons which have velocities comparable to those of the molecules in ordinary hydrogen gas at room temperature. Unfortunately, the neutrons released by the fission of 235 have velocities about 10,000 times as large as this, so that they must be slowed down before they can be used efficiently to produce more fissions. And how do you go about slowing down a neutron? Slowing down is accomplished by allowing the fast neutrons to collide with nuclei of a light element such as carbon or the deuterium contained in heavy water. The fast neutrons give their kinetic energy to the atoms of the slowing down material, which is called a moderator. However, as the neutrons are slowed down, they pass through a velocity range where they are very readily absorbed by the uranium-238 nuclei, and as these nuclei are present in a concentration 140 times as great as the 235 nuclei, the chance of losing our fission neutrons during the slowing down process is very good indeed. The situation is fraught with difficulties on every side, it seems. How do you avoid this difficulty? The uranium is concentrated in rods which are relatively widely spaced in the graphite moderator. With this arrangement, a fast fission neutron leaving one of the uranium rods will be slowed down past the dangerous 238 absorption range before it encounters another uranium rod, so that the possibility, or the probability rather, of its being absorbed by a 235 nucleus is greatly increased, you see. And by proceeding in this manner, you will get one of those chain reactions you mentioned a few minutes ago? Yes. By using very pure uranium and graphite, it has been demonstrated that a self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction can be established by constructing a sufficiently large pile of uranium of uranium and pure graphite with the uranium arranged in a suitable lattice structure of rods. It's amazing when you think of it, all these things going on among such tiny particles. There's another nuclear reaction occurring in the pile which is of very great interest. So far we've considered the capture of neutrons by uranium-238 nuclei only as an obstacle to the maintenance of a chain reaction in the pile. Now actually, the products formed by this reaction are of great importance, and in the piles which have been built for military purposes, it is allowed to proceed to as great an extent as is compatible with the maintenance of the chain reaction. What kind of products would they be, Emerson? Well, the capture of a neutron by uranium-238 forms uranium-239, which is unstable and emits a negative electron from the nucleus, leaving a new element, neptunium, of atomic weight 239 and atomic number 93. That is, it has 93 elementary positive charges on the nucleus. 
This in turn is also unstable and again emits a negative electron from the nucleus, leaving another new element, plutonium, of atomic weight 239 and atomic number 94. Plutonium is still unstable and emits alpha particles from the nucleus. But the transformation occurs at such a relatively slow rate that for most practical purposes, plutonium, like uranium, may be considered stable. The most interesting property of plutonium, however, is that, like uranium-235, it undergoes fission when the nucleus picks up an extra neutron. And just what is the significance of that fact, Emerson? Well, it means that through the formation of plutonium, we can obtain some energy from all of the nuclei in a pound of normal uranium, instead of from only seven one-thousandth of a pound of the uranium-235 contained in it. Oh, by the way, Emerson, how much energy can you get from a pound of uranium-235? It's an enormous amount, Bob. Dr. Kingan says that we may estimate that fission of all the nuclei in one pound of uranium would release energy equivalent to 10 million kilowatt hours. It should be emphasized that this amount of energy is only equivalent to the conversion of one one-thousandth pound of mass. For this is the amount by which the mass of the daughter product atoms would be less than the mass of the parent atom. The remaining 99 and 9 tenths percent of the mass energy is at present entirely inaccessible to us. Well, what are the outlooks for producing usable atomic power, Anderson? Up until now, the energy liberated by fission in the piles has been thrown away in the cooling water. And indeed, this heat has been generated at such a low temperature that it would be impossible to use it efficiently for the production of power. On the other hand, the plutonium, which has been separated chemically from the piles, and the uranium-235, which has been separated by diffusion or by an electromagnetic method from normal uranium, have been used in this highly concentrated form in a bomb. Obviously, in a bomb it is desired to release the energy in as short a time as possible, so that one must rely on the reactions produced by fast neutrons. These reactions being efficient enough to maintain the chain reaction with the purified materials used in the bomb. Now, in this case, the energy is released at too high a temperature and too rapidly to be used in any kind of a heat engine. But it is clear that some kind of compromise between the extremes of the bomb and the present piles should be possible and should be suitable for power production. From where I sit, it looks as if there must be a few problems to be ironed out first. Right you are, Bob. The first is the cost and the scarcity of the raw material. At present, uranium and thorium appear to be the most suitable materials. But these are present in the Earth's crust only to the extent of four and twelve parts per million, respectively. It is therefore highly desirable to find some way of using a more plentiful element. Well, I'm pretty hopeful. Look what Dr. Kingdom and his fellow workers in the field have already done. Yes, and then there's a second problem. It concerns the choice of structural materials for the piles, such as the materials used for the cooling or heat transfer fluid, and for the pipes or other structures for containing this uh, fluid. Finally, there's the problem of continually removing materials produced in the pile, which, if allowed to accumulate, would stop the chain reaction. Then, in a few words, what's the outlook for atomic power, Emerson? Well, although the conversion of mass into energy on a practical scale has been demonstrated and the way to many new technical accomplishments thus opened up, a period of some years of intensive research and development will be needed before an economical power source of this kind may be expected, and that in the meantime, the development and construction of more conventional power plants will probably continue. Thank you, Emerson. Ladies and gentlemen, we've just brought you a story to which there is much detail. If you'd like to have a copy of a paper by Dr. Kenneth H. Kingdon in order you may review the facts we brought you, with some additional ones, we'll be happy to see that you get one. All you have to do to get yours is address your request to Excursions in Science in care of the station to which you are now listening, asking for scientific paper number 213 entitled Atomic Power. Your copy will be sent to you free of charge. Because everyone is asking about things atomic, we spend all our time for this excursion in science going into the matter. We'll get at the uh, answering of your questions on other scientific fields at our next meeting. Until then, I'll say thank you, Emerson Markham, and goodbye, everyone, until our next excursion in science.